<laughs> and now for something completely different. Alrighty then. <laughs> That's what happens when you start recording during mid-conversation. You just walk into a conversation and you guys have no idea what the fuck we're talking about. And we don't necessarily either. But Sarah Milliken. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're all Thanks, giddy and we're baked. And we're ready to listen to Sarah Milliken. <laughs> My eyes are wide open. No, they're not. <laughs> Except for that little piece of dental floss. I should get like glasses. And just be like Johnny Fever all the time, dude. But you have to see eye. If you're doing reaction videos, you have to see your eyes open too, right? You have to see eye reactions. If you put the glasses on, then people are like, "Is he sleeping?" He's or? already contemplating cheating. <laughs> Such a loser. Just sleep. If you're doing a reaction, just sleep it. Yeah. It's kind of like when I sleep at night. Mm. All right. <laughs> sleep walk up. <laughs> Okay, let's watch Sarah. This is a okay. full show home bird. It's gonna be a long one. We'll see how much we can do. Okay. <laughs> She's like, feck. My bladder only lasts 10 minutes. All right. We need a bladder bladder. A bladder bladder. All right, here we go, home bird. Response. Thank you very much. How are you? Are you well? No. Excellent. I'm Thank not. you very much for coming to the show. Uh, I started my tour in September. Before that, I did some previews up and down the UK. I did a preview in a place called Preston. Are we aware of Preston? Yeah. <laughs> I parked my car. I don't know if this is a good indication of what people are like in Preston, but I parked my car outside of the venue. And as I walked into the venue, a man offered me anal sex. <laughs> So I was late. <laughs> I was going to say I'll tell you a bit about me, but I think I just have. <laughs> it's lovely to be here, though. It's a nice temperature in here, isn't it? We'll get warmer as we go on, obviously, the lights and whatnot. I respond in quite a peculiar way to the heat, I think. Uh, mostly sort of here. <laughs> I realise I aimed that just at you guys in the front there, didn't I? Sorry about that. Hey, upstairs can have a go. There you go. <laughs> There gets oh what God. I call claggy. <laughs> Anybody else got a good word for that? Anybody else? <laughs> moist. Who said moist? <laughs> moist is a good word. <laughs> what was that one? Sticky. Sticky. <laughs> oh, there was a lady the other day said, uh, what you've got there is LDF. I said, what does LDF stand for? She said, long day fanny. <laughs> When I said Claggy and Preston, a man said, oh no, we call that ready. <laughs> but what I do when it gets oh moist and sticky, I just do a plie. <laughs> I'm not a massive ballet dancer, but if I was a ballet dancer, I would clearly be a massive one. <laughs> I just do that. <laughs> You only get a couple of seconds relief because it mostly just slicks back together. <laughs> I did a show in Edinburgh and a lady at the back of the room shouted out, you need to use some talc. <laughs> and I thought, surely that just forms a paste. I've got a bit of uh, pop trivia for you. You might not know this. Uh, you know Rihanna? You know Rihanna? Yeah. She has insured her legs for a million dollars. And I don't really know why. Because I'm pretty sure she's a singer. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm almost certain you can do that sitting down. <laughs> I mean, her legs aren't proper anyway. They don't meet at the top or anything. <laughs> 
My mum would say about her, e, she couldn't stop a pig in an alleyway. <laughs> Just for the record, I could totally stop a pig in an alleyway. <laughs> stop it, stun it, put it in me fucking freezer. <laughs> I do have a good relationship with me, ma'am. Uh, you know, sometimes in comedy you laugh at things because it's familiar, because it's a shared experience. Sometimes you laugh because you're just glad you're not me. <laughs> I think this next thing might fall into the latter category. <laughs> See if this has happened to anybody else. Whenever I'm on the phone to me, ma'am, it always makes me need a poo. <laughs> Give us a woo if that's happened to you. <laughs> Phew, if you're good. I've looked into it, it's a closeness issue. It means that me and those people who wooed, we love our mams more than the rest of you lot love yours. <laughs> I love my mam so much it makes me shit. <laughs> Try getting that on a balloon on Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank God for Moon Pig. <laughs> but I discovered something about myself recently that I did not know. I discovered that I am a workaholic. I haven't always been a workaholic. I think it's much easier to be a workaholic when you love your job, which I do. But before this, when I had a proper job and I worked in an office Monday to Friday, I was not a workaholic. I was very happy at five o'clock to go, bye, oh, fuck the lot of you. <laughs> but I read an article about workaholics by a man called Oliver Berkman, and he said people are workaholics for one of two reasons. Either they're hiding away from something at home, or they have nothing else going on in their lives. And I realised quite sadly that I fell into the latter category. I had my job, but I didn't really do or have anything else. One of the remedies he suggested to fix this, he said, actively create meaning elsewhere. And that's what I decided to do over the last 12 months, and that is what my show is about. Now, the first thing I decided to do, I decided to buy a house. I'd lived in the same rented city centre flat in Manchester for the last six years, and I really wanted somewhere. I wanted a house. I wanted to settle down. I wanted a house mostly because I'd lived in flats for 16 years, and I really missed going upstairs to bed. <laughs> Not through the fucking kitchen. <laughs> upstairs to bed. But I was sitting only a few weeks ago, quite smugly, upstairs in bed, thinking, this is the life. I've arrived. I'm upstairs in bed. And then I thought, shit, now I've got to go downstairs for food. <laughs> But what I wanted was somewhere that makes me feel the same way my parents' house makes me feel. They've lived in the same house since they got married 47 years ago. Exactly. And this is what I wanted. I wanted somewhere that I could build memory after memory after memory. Now, I was there sort of late summer last year with my sister, the four of us just sitting around with cups of tea around the kitchen table, putting the world to rights. It was lovely. And at the exact same moment, my sister and I both heard the ice cream man. And it was like no time had passed. No words were exchanged between my sister and I. She shot me a look that said, do you want one? <laughs> and I shot back a look that said, of course I fucking do. <laughs> she picked up her purse and she ran out of the house. When she came back in, she told me there'd be no children anywhere near the ice cream man, just a 44-year-old woman running towards it. <laughs> He'd started to pull away, she had to flag him down. <laughs> and as she flagged him down, he shouted out of the window, Come on, missus, you can do it. <laughs> she came back in with three ice creams, one for me, one for her, and one for me dad, because me mum doesn't really like sweet things. And she said, where's dad gone? Because me dad was no longer in the room. I said he's gone to the toilet. Now, I don't know what your dads are like, but my dad can lose a good 20 minutes, half an hour in there. <laughs> So she started to sort of lick her ice cream and kind of tidy his, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Licking hers normally, but then spinning this one round. She was like a fucking machine, licking and tidying, licking and tidying, licking and tidying. This one started to get quite small, and I said, oh, that's not fair on Dad. And she said, well, what do you want me to do about it? I said, I think you should take it to him while he's on the toilet. <laughs> and she said, well, if I'm going, you're coming with us. <laughs> so we go upstairs together. Mum and Dad's toilet is separate from their bathroom. And I said to my sister, before you go any further, you must promise me one thing. She said, what's that? I said, you must promise me that when you open that door, you keep your eyes tight shut, because you will never be able to unsee what you are about to see. <laughs> She promised, she knocked on the door, my dad said, come in, like it was an office. <laughs> 
And with her eyes tight That's shut, funny. she opened the door and handed in, and I scream. And my dad said, I can I take that? And we thought, quite rightly, because eating ice cream while you're doing a shit is disgusting, isn't it? <laughs> but my dad said, I'm reading the paper, my hands are full. <laughs> But my parents have always lived near a park and I'd always been able to see a tree out of my bedroom window so that became another priority. I wanted to see a tree out of my bedroom window. Didn't give a shit if it was on a fucking roundabout. Just a tree. (laughs) But it became very clear early on that I'm not massively suited to country living having lived in the city centre for so long. I drove along a lovely country lane, lovely country lane and I saw a white marquee tent. And instead of thinking, oh... Somebody's having a lovely summer party. I just thought, oh, someone's been murdered. (laughs) (laughs) One of the houses I looked at was owned by a couple who were getting divorced. It was very sad. And it was the husband who was showing me around. And I'd realised what was going on straight away and I decided just to go through it very quickly because it was clearly painful for both of them. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if you've ever been shown around a house or have shown somebody mm-hmm. around your house, but there's a degree of state in the obvious involved, isn't there, when they say things like, this is the kitchen. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, I call it the biscuit room, but whatever. <laughs> This is the living room. Yeah, it's another biscuit room. <laughs> he took me upstairs to a closed door and he said, this is the master bedroom. I said, great. He said, I'd love to show you in there, but I can't. I said, oh, why not? He said, I can't show you in there because there's a lady crying in there, which is sad, but also quite an unusual way of describing his wife when potentially he's the reason she's crying in the fucking first place. <laughs> but I said to him, look, I, I'm divorced myself. I understand what oh, you're oh going God. through. I know that this is horrible for both of you and you just want to get it over and done with so you can both move on with your lives independently. I understand you have my total sympathy, you really do. But I also know that you can cry in the bathroom, so fucking move her. Now, the house I looked at was owned by a really posh lady, so I already hated her. It's terrible, isn't it? I'm not supposed to hate anybody. I only hate posh twats. It's fine. <laughs> I was going to say, have we got name, but I've just remembered where I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're all clapping. There'll be a couple of people at the back from Jesmond going, actually, there are posh people in tonight. <laughs> The posh lady was very dramatic in all of her gestures. She said to me, there is underfloor heating throughout. <laughs> said, that doesn't impress me, love. I've got slippers. <laughs> and then as if to hammer it home, she said, there isn't a single radiator in the whole building. And I, because sometimes my mouth kicks in before my brain's had a chance, just said, well, how do you dry your knickers then? <laughs> and the friend that I was with said, just chuck them on the floor. <laughs> But I found a house that I liked and I got a survey done and the survey came back and it meant nothing to me at all. But luckily I've got a friend who's a builder and he said, let me have a look at it and I'll put it into layman's terms for you, said smashing. Now give us a cheer if you own your own home. Give us a cheer if you rent. See, up until this point, I'd only ever rented, and I think there are phrases that mean nothing to those of us who rent that the rest of you understand. Because my friend, the builder, said, there is one thing you will need. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He said, you'll need a damp-proof course. And I genuinely said, I haven't got time to go to college. (laughs) (laughs) But the house that I bought had a log burner. I've never had a log burner before. I got quite excited about the log burner. Not as excited as my fella did. He just went, oh, my God, we'll be able to get a toasting fork. (laughs) Oh, we'll be able to toast things. And I thought, he does know I've got a toaster, doesn't he? (laughs) But I went straight out. He went to work. I went straight out and bought a toasting fork. And I came back in. I grabbed a loaf of bread. And I thought, I'm just going to sit and work my way through. I fucking love toast. (laughs) But I couldn't get it to work. And I rang him and I said, I can't get it to work. He said, how can it not work? It's fire and bread. (laughs) I told him what I'd been doing. Turns out I should have had the little door open. (laughs) Well, he did that on purpose, huh? as well have been lying slices of bread on top of me radiators <laughs> I ran amongst me knickers on the underfloor heating <laughs> oh you're right that's probably too much yeast altogether isn't it <laughs> <laughs> but when I moved 
from the flat to the house. I had bits and bobs of furniture, not much, but I had some stuff and I was trying to work out what would best go away. And I said to me, fella, God, I wish I had a tape measure. He said, what do you need a tape measure for? I said, I just want to know if that unit will fit in that alcove. And he said, well, I can sort that out for you. I said, I don't want you to move it. He said, no, I, I can work it out for you. And I said, have you got a tape measure? He said, no, but I've just got like an instinct about these things. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> fucking instinct. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at your instinct, pet. <laughs> And I said, go on then. So this is genuinely what he did. He went like this. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that. I've done that. Yeah, yeah, that'll fit. I, have totally I said, done is that. that it? You could at least got your cock out and done six inches, six inches, six inches. <laughs> But you know when you first move in somewhere that's new to you, you want to make a few changes, don't you? So it feels a bit more like yours. One of the things I really wanted, like my parents are both disabled and both getting on a bit in age, and I thought something that would be really good for when they come to stay would be a grab rail in the shower. I won't really notice it when I'm in the shower, but when they come to stay, that would be very useful for them. So I got a grab rail fitted in the shower. And like a month later, I had a friend round visiting, and I was shown around the house, you know, biscuit room, other biscuit room. <laughs> Carefully don't trip up on all the knickers and bread. <laughs> We got to the bathroom and I said, oh, look, I've had a grab rail fitted in the shower. And she went like this. Ooh, saucy. <laughs> said, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm trying to keep pensioners upright. <laughs> and I told me down because I thought he'd find it funny. And he went, nah, nah, for that sort of business, you need two of them. <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> Another thing I really fancied, I uh, really fancied a little stool in the bathroom. Uh, that sounds really bad. That sounds bad, doesn't it sound bad? Like a table, I suppose. One of my luxuries is I like having a cup of tea when I'm in the bath, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a special place to put my cup of tea? And maybe I could also put a book or a magazine on there to read in the bath. How nice would that be? And then, depending on where I position the table or the stool, I could maybe reach the book or magazine from the toilet. Now, not everybody will admit to this, but I will raise my hand and say that I like to read on the toilet. Give us a cheer. Any men who like to read on the toilet? Yeah. Any women? Yeah. See, interesting, because one of my friends said to me, you don't tell people you do that, do you? I said, yeah. She said, I don't think you should. I said, why not? She said, I don't know, I just, I don't think it's very ladylike. I said, have you seen who you're talking to? I said, anyway, I'm not sure what you mean, because as far as I'm aware, there's nothing ladylike about doing a shit. <laughs> Picture the scene. Uh, I'm sitting down, my legs are apart, my elbows are resting on my knees. Uh, I might be sweating. <laughs> if it's a hard one, I could have taken my top off. <laughs> but to make up for all of that, I do it exactly the same. But to make it ladylike, I do it all in a fucking bonnet. <laughs> Those two words aren't together often enough for their fucking bonnet. <laughs> You're never going to get that inner pride and prejudice, are you? <laughs> Why, Mr. Darcy, what do you think of me fucking bonnet? <laughs> Second thing I decided to do, I decided to get a pet. I've always grown up with pets and in my teens and in my 20s. And then there's something about the lifestyle of being a comedian that means you're on the road a lot. It's not really conducive to having animals at home. And then I thought, you know, I've done this eight years. Maybe it's time the lifestyle worked around me for a change. So I really wanted a cat. I got a cat two years ago. I got another cat last year. My fella seems to think I just wanted two cats. He doesn't realise it's now an annual event. <laughs> The second cat we got is a rescue cat. She was just left outside of the vets in a box overnight, just left. Yeah. And she's lovely, she's very affectionate. Whenever my fella picks her up, she starts purring straight away and he looks her right in the face and he goes, who would abandon you? Who would abandon you? <laughs> I said, stop saying that to her. It's like somebody saying to me, who would divorce you? <laughs> Someone fucking did. <laughs> That's a good point. But 
I do worry that I tell people a bit too soon in any conversation that I've got cats. I've got cats, it's too soon, it's too soon. I've got cats, that's lovely, and your account number is. <laughs> and that's because they're not too bad in the middle. But I've often got big scratches on my arms, and I don't want anybody to ever misconstrue what those scratches are. I don't want anybody to ever leave my company going, she seemed really happy, but did you see her arms? <laughs> When truth be told, it's because I cuddle them too tight and the fuckers fight back. <laughs> but the first cat we got uh, two years ago, a little ginger kitten, he's called Chief Brody, named after the police chief in Jaws. Oh, yeah. He's still living in the flat at the time. And I thought, I'll let him have a wander around, get his bearings, have a bit of a sniff, a bit of an investigate. And he went round the back of the sofa, and I was quite surprised, because I'd lived there for six years, and I'd never been round the back of the sofa. <laughs> and the hoover certainly fucking hadn't. <laughs> and he came back round with what can only be described as four big grey fluffy slippers on. <laughs> So I sent him back round to finish the job. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to litter train a cat. It's normally quite straightforward. Whenever they look like they're about to do something, you pick them up and you plonk them in the litter tray. You hope for the best. But Chief Brody took a while to cotton on, kept having it laxed into poor bugger. And at one point, my fellow and I were standing over the litter tray, just looking at each other, going, is there anything we could be doing to help them that we're not already doing? And my fellow, because he's so lovely, he looked down at the litter tray and he went, do you want me to do a shit in it to start him off? <laughs> no. No, I really don't. It would be end to end. <laughs> the cat would be like, who the fuck lives here? Aslan. <laughs> but I have two friends who look after my cats when I'm away from home. One of them is an animal lover, one not so much. Give us a cheer if you consider yourself an animal lover. Yay! Give us a cheer if you're not really bothered. Yay! It's totally fine, isn't it? It's totally fine. My friend who is the animal lover, she looks after them because she loves them. My friend who isn't the animal lover, she looks after them because she loves me. It's very sweet. So the friend who is the animal lover, when she looks after them, she'll take a photograph of them to send to me. And underneath the photograph, it'll say, Hiya, ma'am. Because they call me ma'am. It's not weird. Fuck off. <laughs> And I know that we're close, because whenever I see them, they always need a shit. <laughs> they say, hiya, ma'am, we miss you, we'll see you soon, and it settles me. Wherever I am in the country or the world, it settles me, because I know that they're safe and that they're happy. My friend who isn't the animal lover takes a picture just the same, but underneath her picture, it'll say, here is the photograph you requested. <laughs> <laughs> they are still alive, I will check again tomorrow. <laughs> They are house cats, they don't go outside, they will go outside at some point, but I'm sort of nervous. I'm nervous, I'm nervous for their safety, but also I'm a little bit worried about what they might bring back in with them. I know this is a thing that cats do. Have we got cat owners in tonight? Yeah. Quite a few of you. Now I know that whatever they bring in, be it a mouse or a bird, uh, if it's still alive, I'm going to try and catch it and put it back in the garden. And if it's dead, I'm going to put it in the outside bin. That's fine. But what I don't know is what I'm supposed to do if whatever they bring in is still a little bit... <laughs> Twitchy. Yeah. Has this happened to any of you? Yeah. Oh, nearly all of you. This is horrible. Let's get some suggestions what you think I should do. Let's start at the top. So, anybody in the top section got a suggestion what I should do with a half dead animal? Shout out. Put a bucket over it. Put a bucket over it. <laughs> Have you done that, love? Yes. Yes. What animal was it? A bird and a mouse and a rat. A bird and a mouse and a rat at the same time. <laughs> like a tiny little rubbish zoo. <laughs> so are these all separate occasions? Separate. Yes. And so you put the bucket over it until... The husband came home. Oh. <laughs> until your husband came home. <laughs> We've got a feminist in, girls. <laughs> and then what did he do? Luckily they'd all died. Luckily they'd all died. <laughs> the best sentence I've heard in ages. <laughs> we should all start adding that on to the end of all of our stories. Luckily, they all died. <laughs> Good answer, lady upstairs. Anybody in the next section down got a suggestion what I should do with a half-dead animal? Hit it with a spade. Hit it with a spade. <laughs> he didn't even have to think of that, did he? Just hit it with a spade. <laughs> hit it with... Is that, have you done that, love? Yes. Yes. <laughs> 
you're definitely an animal. <laughs> you've got a couple of ex-wives in your garden or anything. <laughs> Anybody else in that section? Yeah. CPR. CPR. Oh, oh. God. You, the rest of you feel like such shits now. <laughs> CPR. Have you done that? Yes. Yes. What animal was it, love? It was a cat. <laughs> Either, option one, she has not understood the question. <laughs> option two, her cat brought in another cat. <laughs> I'm gonna go with option two, because that feels awesome to me. <laughs> Anybody in the next section down got a suggestion what I should do with a half-dead animal? <coughs> give it back to us, can finish it off. <laughs> give it back to the, give it back to the cat. So, so we can finish it off. And when you, okay, when you say finish it off, all right, sorry, you mean eat it. Okay, sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> one tiny final wank. And a cat couldn't even do that because they don't have that kind of hands. It'd have to do it with its paws. <laughs> Well, you've just made me mime a cat wanking off a mouse. <laughs> Dirty bastards. <laughs> so you mean give it back to the cat so the cat can eat it? I like that idea because that feels like good parenting, doesn't it? Because it's like, finish your tea or you're not playing out. <laughs> I like it, it's good. Uh, anybody else in that section? Put it on YouTube. Put it on YouTube? <laughs> oh, we've got a young one in. <laughs> How old are you, Flower? 25. 25. Get out. Fuck off. <laughs> Look around you, love. You don't belong. <laughs> that was so much fun. Sorry. <laughs> Being rude to young people, you should try it, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> next level down, so are you the grand circle? Is that what, are you the grand circle? So the lady there, like, yes, we're grand. Okay. <laughs> so the grand circle, anybody got a suggestion what to do with a half-dead animal? Bash it with a hammer. Bash it with a hammer. <laughs> Fuck, where are you from? The felon. <laughs> There's a lady cheering that I've just implied that she's from the felon because you're clearly from the felon. Yeah! <laughs> we wash things with hammers! <laughs> Anybody else in that section? Chuck it over next door. Chuck it over next door! <laughs> That's a good idea. It's neighbor. Who are you dealing with? <laughs> Anything that stops you having to talk to your neighbors. <laughs> Good answer, thank you very much. Anybody in the boxes or downstairs got a suggestion? Hold on, hold on. We're coming back to you. <laughs> Say that again, love. Put it in a pie because you know it's still fresh. <laughs> it's clearly all he's bothered about. Is it fresh? Yeah, well, I'll eat it. Doesn't matter what the fuck it is. Have you have you done that? Oh, with you've, oh, you've so you've had chips with it as well. Oh, and what kind of animals have you put in pies? Nothing exciting, just a pigeon. That's gross. Pussy pie's nice. <laughs> Wowzers. You actually went there, didn't you? He's doing that with his arm as well, like he's a fucking winner. Something tells me by how mortified your girlfriend is that you're not going to get any of that for a while. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so pie, and there was another one at the back. Shout again. Put it in a cage and keep it as a pet. Keep a half dead animal as a pet. <laughs> Have you done that? It was fine, it came back to life all right. Oh, what animal was it? It was a vole. It was a vole. <laughs> the lady at the front is a big fan of fucking voles. <laughs> Finally, somebody mentions voles. How long have I fucking been here? Nearly half an hour. Nobody's done any vole jokes yet. And how long did it live? It lived for about a month and then it escaped. <laughs> you know why it escaped? Because it's a fucking wild animal. It didn't escape, it went home. Anybody else downstairs? 
give it to the dog to chew on. <laughs> so I've got to get a dog now. <laughs> do I do with the stuff the dog brings in? Give it to your horse. Fucking hell. <laughs> this is going to get out of hand. <laughs> See, I asked this question when I was working in Australia uh, last year and I would occasionally shit myself. I slightly forget I was in Australia and when people would say things like lizards, I would think, fucking lizards? I didn't know this might happen. Tiny dinosaurs, because that's what they are. <laughs> One lady said, my cat brings in half-dead lizards and I said, what do you do? She said, I take them to the vet and then after a week I go back and check up on them. I said, well, what happens when you go back and check up on them? She said, well, the vet always says I managed to revive them and I've released them back into the wild. And I thought, oh, bless your cotton socks for fucking believing that, love. <laughs> they must see her coming, mustn't they? <laughs> oh, fuck, it's lizard woman again. <laughs> With a bag of half lizards. <laughs> Expecting us to match them all up. Brenda, look, that doesn't go. The pattern's different, can you see? <laughs> Try that one. No, but I've seen that one somewhere before. <laughs> Another lady said that her cat brought in a half-dead parrot. I said, what did you do with a half-dead parrot? She said, I just put my fingers over its nostrils for a while. <laughs> Which is all very well until the parrot realises it has a mouth. <laughs> <gasps> Fuck, that was close, that was close. <laughs> Then one really serious lady, very straight face, she said, uh, Drowned it. I said, what did you drown? She said, it was a frog. <laughs> I love the idea of a frog going, Oh no, don't put it in the water. I hate the water. That's my natural habitat, she's a fucking idiot. Oh no. <laughs> but my sister said, are you going to bury all of the animals your cat's bringing in the garden? And I said, no, because it's the first time I've had a garden as an adult. I'm not about to turn it into a pet cemetery. <laughs> then I thought about it, and there is a plus side to this. Think of how many magnums I'd have to eat for all of the little lolly stick crosses. <laughs> but I've been trying to relax a bit. I'm not very good at relaxing. Uh, I took the opportunity when I moved into the house to buy myself some new pyjamas. Uh, I normally save that luxury for Christmas. Does anybody else get new pyjamas at Christmas? Yeah. So I brought it forward by a month when I moved into the house and I went off to Marks and Spencers. I don't know if you know this, but Marks and Spencers don't really sell pyjamas anymore. They sell stay-at-home leisure wear. <laughs> so I, I, I looked them on the hanger and I thought they looked like pyjamas. So I bought them anyway, I took them home, I put them on straight away and I thought they feel like pyjamas. And I thought this is just Marks and Spencers being overly fancy with the name and of things. That's all it is. And I thought what would be the difference between pyjamas and something called stay-at-home leisure wear anyway? And then I went to do the dishes. I stood in front of the kitchen sink and I went to roll my sleeves up. And the cuffs on the stay-at-home leisure wear were so tight that I couldn't roll my sleeves up. So I couldn't do the dishes. <laughs> and I like to think that was Marks and Spencer's going, hey you, sit yourself down. <laughs> but then you look, the night is will be flammable and I'll get out the fucking cooking and all. <laughs> I think you can't be too relaxed. I, uh, I think it's possible to be too relaxed because I think the filter that's between your brain and your mouth is there for a reason. I went for massages with a friend of mine. We came out afterwards, got in the car to go home. I was driving, she was in the passenger seat. And we were both so floppy and relaxed after the massages that neither of us spoke for ages. It was really comfortable, a proper comfortable silence, if you like. I was just concentrating on the driving. She was watching the scenery go by out of the window. It was lovely. 20 minutes we were like that. 20 minutes of complete silence. She chose to break the 20 minute silence with this sentence. I tell you who else is a bad driver. <laughs> the third thing I decided to do, I decided to learn to cook. I've lived off ready meals and toast for far too long and I thought I've got a nice kitchen now maybe I should learn to cook and I'm learning it's going quite well I don't always know the right words for things I can't I couldn't remember the word marinate recently when I was trying to describe a recipe to my friend that I'd had a go of I said look then you get the chicken it's dead straightforward get the chicken you put some olive oil on it uh, then you get some lemon thyme you put that in with it and you cover it and leave it in the fridge overnight to fester <laughs> really, 
festering in the fridge. I was in a, a cafe a few months ago with one of my friends. She's the sort of person who prefers savoury over sweet. I don't really know why we're still friends. <laughs> it's nice enough. She ordered a carrot cake, and I was thinking a carrot cake is such an abomination of a cake. It's like it's got veg in it. Fuck off. <laughs> Some people choose to put dates and nuts in it. You think, you're just removing all of the cake aspects. What you've got there is a shitty pasty. <laughs> so she ordered a carrot cake, added a slice of strawberry cheesecake. On top of her carrot cake was some icing and then a slither of something orange coloured for decoration, I suppose. And I said to her, is that a bit of carrot? Fair assumption of being carrot cake. And she had a little nibble of it and she went, no, it's not carrot. I said, is it orange then? She said, no, it's not orange. So, well, I'm all out of orange-coloured things. <laughs> yeah, Unless it's the tail of a goldfish, I've got no idea. <laughs> she had another nibble of it, and she said, I think it's apricot. I said, oh, I can't have apricot. She said, why not? I said, I'm allergic to it. She said, ooh, what happens to you? <laughs> I said, ooh, I get the shits. <laughs> She said, is it really bad? I said, oh, yeah, it was like a chocolate fountain down there. <laughs> and she said, was that just off one? I said, no, no, I had a bag of them. <laughs> she said, how many was in the bag? I said, I don't know, maybe 40. <laughs> and it was only as I was telling her that I realised I'm not allergic to apricots. <laughs> I'm allergic to 40 apricots. <laughs> But I was on holiday with my sister last year. And I don't get to see my sister often enough. And it was lovely to have a week together, just the two of us. It was really nice. And at the end of the week, she said something to me that I'll always hold dear. She said, it wasn't until I spent a week with you that I realised how many meals you can have in a day. <laughs> She had mistakenly thought that you had breakfast and lunch, or you had brunch. And <laughs> no. <laughs> breakfast, brunch, elevens is lunch. <laughs> Afternoon tea, proper tea, dinner, supper. <laughs> elevens is. <laughs> and then a midnight snack that can last anything up to eight hours. <laughs> and a Milky Way whenever the fuck you like. <laughs> But I've got a friend who's uh, really good at cooking and baking and she, she, I was on the phone to her, she was showing off a little bit, she knows some random food facts and she said, uh, did you know that sugar is a preservative? I said, ooh, I'll live forever then. <laughs> she said, no, you'll probably die quite young but you won't go off for ages. <laughs> She said to me, if you want to learn to cook, why don't I just come and stay for the weekend and I'll teach you some basics? And I thought, actually, it's a really good idea. She said, do you mind if before I come, if I email you a list of things I think you should have in your store cupboard? I've never called it my store cupboard in my life. It's always been the bean cupboard, because that's where I keep my tins of beans. <laughs> but I was a good girl. I got everything in that she suggested. I ordered it online. I'd never ordered food online for delivery before. If you've never done it, give it a go. It's amazing. I typed it into a computer. And a man brought it to the house. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, fuck off, it's real. <laughs> Typed it into a computer. Somehow a fella got the message who had a van <laughs> and some food. And he brought it. You're not taking it seriously. A man brought food to my house. It was like being in a restaurant, but I didn't have to have a bra on. <laughs> But like Nando's then. <laughs> <laughs> Only a few weeks ago, my fella said to me, he said, your day-to-day -day is busier than mine. He said, do you want me to go and do a quick food shop? And I thought, and I said, oh, that would be amazing. Thanks very much. I said, I'm, I'm only here for a couple of days, so don't get loads in. He said, just give us a list. So I said, great. So I made him a list, off he went. When he came back in, he said, I managed to get everything off the list apart from one thing. I said, that's great. Thanks very much. I started to unpack the bags, put them in the cupboards. And I said, what was the thing you didn't manage to get? He said, I didn't manage to get you any avocados. I said, oh, that's all right. Don't worry about that. He said, so I bought you some pork pies instead. <laughs> I said, I wish you worked for Tesco Home Delivery. <laughs> well, you've run out of celery, so we've given you a Swiss roll. <laughs> but he said, the best thing about them, he said, they're whoops pork pies. I said, I don't know what that means. He said, they're whoops pork pies. He said, they're going to run out. We'll have to eat all six of them before we go to bed. Yes. <laughs> But 
But you know those uh, cookie shops on the high street where you can get the normal sized cookies, but you can also get the bigger sort of celebration ones. He bought me one of those, a uh, celebration one, uh, a few years ago for part of my Christmas present. And it was smashing. It was, it was unexpected. It was great. And I opened the box and I said, this is a great present. This is excellent. He said, oh, I'm glad you like it. It was all iced Merry Christmas cereal with kisses on. He said, I'm glad you like it. He said, there's only one drawback. And I'm looking at a cookie that's bigger than me head, thinking there's no fucking drawback. <laughs> he said, there's only one drawback. It only lasts five days. <laughs> I said, it's like you don't know me at all. <laughs> he said, you didn't let me finish. It only lasts five days. And I bought it four days ago. <laughs> he said, stop your fucking chatting and get the kettle on then. <laughs> That's not a present, love. That's a challenge. <laughs> I think most people at Christmas, pretty much everybody in this room, will get one slightly shitty Christmas present. Just slightly shitty Christmas present. Usually for somebody who doesn't know you very well. And you look at it and you think, how did they? Why did they? What the fuck is a pomander? <laughs> now, last Christmas, my shitty Christmas present was off my fella. Exactly. <laughs> And it was a long-handled metal shoehorn. <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Now, if you get your shitty Christmas present off your Auntie Brenda, you have to go, thanks very much, Auntie Brenda. I'll be able to put my shoes on from a great height now. <laughs> but the joy of it being off your partner is you're allowed to go, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Which is what I did. And he said... You asked for it. I said, no, I bloody didn't. <laughs> and this is where I found out something quite adorable about my fella. All year round, whenever I mention something, like I fancy that DVD, or I might get myself that book, he makes a note of it in his phone. Aww. And when it comes to Christmas or birthdays, he picks a couple of things off the list and he buys me them as presents, which I just think is adorable. But it did mean that when I said to him, when did I ask for a long-handled metal shoehorn? <laughs> he said, August the 8th. <laughs> at 8 p.m. <laughs> the only possible scenario I can think of where this might have happened is maybe I was trying a dress on that was a little bit too tight and to try and make myself feel better and laugh it off I said something like oh could do with a show horn to get into this <laughs> and instead of giving me the cuddle that I clearly fucking needed <laughs> he made a note of it in his phone <laughs> show horn that's what she wants <laughs> You know, some people are tricky to buy for for birthdays and things. If, if you have somebody in your life like this, then listen up. This next thing might be useful for you. And we've got a birthday rule. Our birthday rule is that if it's your birthday, you get to make all of the decisions all day for both of you. It's my fella's last birthday, his first decision. He said, I want a lion. Excellent. Happy with that. We had a lion. Second decision, he said, I want a sausage sandwich, which was not the euphemism I was hoping it was. <laughs> I was all like, should I be the bread? <laughs> oh, you're putting the grill on. Okay. <laughs> Third decision, he wanted to go to Warwick Castle. Now, I'm sure some of you may well have been to Warwick Castle. I'm sure the castle part of it is an absolute delight. We didn't get to do that bit. The only bit he wanted to do was the dungeon. He likes reading horror stories. He likes watching horror films. I don't like any of that sort of thing. I don't like being scared. I don't even, I'm not a massive fan of the dark, if I'm brutally honest. It's, I'm a bit of a wuss. And I thought this whole experience is going to be horrible for me. But birthday rules, we have to go. So we go to Warwick Castle, and at the door to the dungeon is a man. And the man has fake blood on his face and hands and is dressed in some sort of costume. And being a little claustrophobic as I am, I thought this is about to include two of the things I hate the most. Enclosed spaces and fucking actors. Because <laughs> it wasn't like a museum. It wasn't just glass cases with things in to look at and little bits of writing that you don't bother reading because it's boring. It wasn't like that. It was properly interactive. Every room had a different scenario. Uh, there were volunteers required throughout and there was always a chance that somebody was going to jump out and frighten the living shit out of you. <laughs> now, I knew I was going to hate it and it was proved right as soon as we started to walk in. Now, one thing to point out is, well, I guess these tours normally have 10 or 12 or 15 people on them all going around as one. I don't know why, maybe just because it was a Tuesday, but it was only two of us. 
So every time they needed a volunteer, it was me or him or both of us. <laughs> and also, it was the final tour of the day. We'd overheard a couple of the actors talking outside, saying that if we hadn't turned up, they would have all been able to go home an hour early. <laughs> so they already didn't really like us. Now we go down the stairs at the beginning, and I already hate it because it's dark, it smells funny, and there's sort of the walls are kind of running with water. It's horrible. Birthday rules, we have to do it though. Now we go into the first room. The first room is quite well lit, it's not too bad. It's a courtroom, and there's a man playing a judge, and just me and my fella. Uh, we are both tried. I was tried for being a witch. Rude. <laughs> and he was tried for weighing in a well. Apt. <laughs> We are both sentenced to death, which I thought was a little harsh. <laughs> but I thought, if it's all like this, this is going to be OK. Now, how wrong you can be. You go into the next room. The next room is completely pitch black. So dark, you can't see your hand in front of your face. And it's also completely silent. Now, I'd been linked into my fella holding on for dear life. Somebody came up behind us who we couldn't see and just unraveled us and separated us, put him over the other side of the room. So I couldn't see him. I couldn't touch him. But every now and again, I could hear him say, you're going to be all right, you're going to be all right. Because <laughs> he knew the state I was getting myself into. Already starting to shake quite a bit. <laughs> now, they left us in the darkness and the silence for about a minute, and then a bright white light flashed, and an old lady screamed in my face. <laughs> I don't know which bit of history that's supposed to represent, but it felt very much like Christmas with me nana. <laughs> We go in another couple of rooms, they're quite scary but not too bad. One of the scariest parts of the whole experience is just a corridor, just a corridor between one room and the next. But it was dimly lit and there were horrific things everywhere we looked. Until we realised halfway along that they were mirrors. <laughs> At one point I'd whispered to my fella, that monster's got my top on. The final room is a hospital room. There is a bed with a body on it, and the body I've already clocked is a dummy, so it doesn't mean it can't move, but at least it's not going to jump out at me. And a man walks in and addresses us both. And he says, I'm not the doctor. So I went, <laughs> OK. <laughs> and he went, the doctor died of the plague. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> and he went, I'm the cook. And I thought, ooh, snacks. <laughs> Apparently not. He said, I'm the cook and I'm replacing the doctor because I'm the only other one who knows about anatomy. So I just went, promotion, well done. <laughs> and he walked forward and he stood just in front of me. And he was so close to me, I could feel his breath on my face. And he looked at me and he said, you don't look very well. <laughs> and I crumpled. <laughs> I've just got a bit of a cold. <laughs> and then he said, I think you need some treatment. I'm taking dinners. <laughs> and I've got some tunes in me handbag. Why don't you do it to him? It's his birthday. <laughs> and then he said, I think you need an operation. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, you shit. <laughs> he took me by the hand, he sat me on a seat and he pulled around us both a very thin white muslin curtain. We are within the curtain. My fella is on the outside of the curtain. We are now the show. My fella is the only audience member. <laughs> this whole fucking thing is just for him. <laughs> the cook pulls out a knife, this sort of size, like a, maybe like a dagger, and he shows it round the front of the curtain so my fella can see it really clearly. He brings it back round again, and he presses a button on the chair behind me, which is the sound effect of a woman screaming. <laughs> Pulls out another knife, maybe like a machete, this sort of size. And again, he shows it round the front of the curtain so my fella can see it. Brings it back round again, presses another button of a woman screaming. Now, by this stage, I am physically shaking from head to toe. My palms are sweaty and I feel quite sick. But all I can think is, 
I wonder what we're going to do for my fucking birthday. <laughs> Because my birthday is after his, my birthday no longer becomes about what I actually might want to do, but about what he will fucking hit. <laughs> the cook pulls out the final weapon as a side, huge like this. And again, he shows it round the front so my fella can see. He brings it back round again and presses the most blood-curdling scream of all. And I thought, I know this is fake, but I wonder what the expression on my fella's face is right now. And I could see him very clearly through the curtain. I looked at his face, and he was checking his phone for text messages. <laughs> As we walked out, I said, I can't believe you were playing on your phone. He said, to be honest, I was just surprised I could get a signal down there. <laughs> we got in the car to go home. I said, you know what we're gonna do for my birthday? He said, no, I don't. What are we gonna do for your birthday? I said, you know what we're gonna do for my birthday? He said, I don't, what are we going to do for your birthday? I said, we're going to talk about our feelings for nine <laughs> fucking hours. No. No. No way. As it happens, that's not what we did. My birthday rolled around a month later, and all I really wanted to do was wander around John Lewis. <laughs> it's me happy place. I wanted to wander around the homeway section touching things. That's all I wanted to do. So we go to John Lewis, we're in the homeway section, but the whole time he is three or four paces behind me playing on his phone, and I thought, oh, this isn't fair. I was disemboweled on his fucking birthday. <laughs> and I should have learned from earlier experience that he is not good to take shopping. On a previous occasion, we'd been in a different department store. I decided to look for a new dress. I picked three to try on, and I parked them. You know how you can park your fella either at the shoes, because there's seats there, and they like that. <laughs> or you can park them at the fitting room, because then there's sometimes another fella there, and they can make a little friend. <laughs> so I parked them at the fitting room. I took three dresses in to try on. I came out after each one to show them. After the first one, I said, what do you think of this one? And he went, it's all right. <laughs> Keep pumping out compliments like that, and we'll not get this big head back in the fucking car. <laughs> And back in came back on the second one. I said, this is the second one. What do you think of this one? And he went, it's nice. <laughs> I feel so pretty. <laughs> and back in came back on the third one. I said, this is the best one. This is my favorite one. I've saved the best to last. What do you think of this one? And he went, yeah, yeah, you could wear that one outside. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think the other two were? Fucking nighties. <laughs> So I should have learned from that experience, but I had not learned from that experience. We're now in John Lewis, in the homeway section, on my birthday. And he is three or four paces behind me, playing on his phone like a petulant teenager. And I turned around and I said, oh, this isn't on. He said, what's the matter with you? I said, no, this is my birthday. You need to pay attention. You need to be interested in things. You need to be present. Yeah. And he said, sorry, love. And he put his phone in his pocket. He said, what are we looking at? Show us what we're looking at. And I said, I've been looking at the duvet covers, and I found one that I liked. It was nice and bright and flowery. I said, I like this one. What do you think of that one? And he looked at it, and he went... That's horrible. <laughs> and I thought, well, I did ask for your opinion, I suppose. Maybe you should get your fucking phone out again. <laughs> I said, I like it. What's horrible about it? And he looked at it again and he went, it's loud. It's gaudy. It's for children. And he must have seen my face just drop because this is not what my birthday was supposed to be. And he wanted to fix it because he is a lovely man after all. And he was so convinced that the next thing he said was going to make everything okay. He just went, it's very you, though, love. <laughs> we tried. Now, I went, for, uh, I went for a medical assessment recently, nothing serious, quite a standard medical assessment, uh, just sort of height and weight and blood pressure and heart rate, that sort of thing. But I wasn't really looking forward to the weight bit because I don't have skills at home, I don't believe in them. Uh, I do have kitchen skills now, and I'd be lying if I said I hadn't weighed anything of myself in them. <laughs> Left one's heavier. Interesting. <laughs> but I don't have bathroom skills. I don't think it's healthy. Why would I do something every day that makes me feel a bit shit? <laughs> so I do instead. I think a lot of people do this. It's a much healthier way of doing it. You just judge it on your clothes, don't you? Judge it on your clothes, and then when your clothes start getting a bit tight, you think, well, maybe it's time I went out and bought bigger clothes. <laughs> 
So I told the doctor I wasn't really looking forward to the weight, but he said, we still have to do it. I said, no, I understand. I'm just trying to think of a way to make it a bit more fun. And he said, well, what do you suggest? I said, well, how about this? Simple as this. How about I guess my own weight? And he said, okay, we can do that. So I guessed my own weight, and I got it right, and I was fucking thrilled. <laughs> and he just went, nobody's ever been that happy about being that weight before. <laughs> I thought was a little mean so I said back uh, perhaps too loudly and also I don't know where this came from it just fell out of my mouth I just went it's more important to be right than to be thin <laughs> feels like I might have read it on a t-shirt I don't know where that came from but if that's going to be my mantra that's quite a good mantra isn't it it's much better than what Kate Moss said I don't know if you know this Kate Moss the model said nothing tastes as good is skinny feels. Let me just say that to you again so it can probably sink in all of your heads. She said, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And I thought, well, she's obviously never had millionaire shortbread, has she? <laughs> and my response to her would be, nothing looks as good as not being a cunt. <laughs> But I stopped buying women's magazines. About six months ago, I stopped buying women's magazines because it feels like there's nothing in there for me. I might as well be buying a magazine about yachts. There's just nothing in there for me. Why would I buy anything where the only time I ever see anybody who looks a bit like me is underneath the word before? <laughs> magazines always maintain that they're about improving women's lives and it's bullshit because they never they never tell you just to see your friends more often or to read more books it's always the physical things that we're supposed to do to ourselves and the list of those things is quite ridiculous you can have your eyebrows waxed your eyelashes tinted your skin darkened your teeth lightened manicures pedicures cleansed tone and moisturized i'm 38 i've cleansed i've moisturized i've no idea what toning actually is <laughs> Does anybody give us a woo if you do? <laughs> a few of you. Does anybody shout out what it is? No. <laughs> I'll woo, but I'm not explaining it to her. <laughs> like makeup. I like wearing makeup. I like wearing it on stage. I like wearing it if I go out somewhere nice. But I don't think I need to wear it all the time. And I don't think I look weird if I don't have any on. I still don't really understand why I paint over naturally rosy cheeks to then apply rosy cheeks. <laughs> Like, hair removal is a whole subject all on its own, isn't it? There's so many different ways, especially as women, that we can remove our hair. You can wax, you can shave, you can pluck, you can epilate. My sister had laser treatment. Laser treatment, which is supposed to be permanent. She had it to her underarms. It was quite painful and quite expensive. And after two months, the whole lot just grew back in. <laughs> which is terrible, but does go some way to explaining why James Bond was always so nonchalant when a laser was aimed at his cock and balls. <laughs> Come back in a couple of months, man, I'll be champion. <laughs> I feel as I've made James Bond a Geordie. <laughs> Maybe that's the future. <laughs> Two cheers for a James Bond that's Geordie, how nice. But according to women's magazines, there are only two options for hair down there for women. One of my friends said to me recently, she said, um, you know why women are supposed to have hair down there, don't you? And I said... Is it like your nose, so you don't get muck up it? <laughs> and she said, no. <laughs> she said, women are supposed to have hair down there so that nature knows where your reproductive bits are. I said, why does nature need to know? <laughs> Surely as long as me fella's got a rough idea. <laughs> why do all the deers and the rabbits need to know? <laughs> well, maybe the rabbits. <laughs> Actually, as an aside, I should tell you this. I did recently treat myself to a new... Uh, and <laughs> I cannot recommend it highly enough. Uh, it's only got the one speed, which I think a lot of people in this room would be like, one speed, that sounds rubbish. You know what the speed is? Fucking hell yes, that's the speed. <laughs> Any vibrator that oh, needs yeah. a square battery is already fine by me. <laughs> Problem, if you can call it that. The problem with it being so fast and efficient <laughs> is that I can't. Oh, uh, I can't always get a scenario going in my head. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? 
You know what I fucking mean. Because <laughs> normally, normally, I'd be like this. Um, not out loud, I don't do it out loud. <laughs> I'm just doing it for you. But normally I'd be like this. Um, he walks in the room. He's wearing a suit. I like him to have a job. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but with the new, oh, with the new one, it's much more like this. Um, there's a knock at the door. Oh, done. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what it is. What it actually is is an electric toothbrush with a special end. <laughs> just feel the need to share it with you. <laughs> the information, I didn't bring it with us. Just work it along the aisles, girls. <laughs> but I'd, even though it's a toothbrush, I did use it as a toothbrush because I'm nervous because I get the ends mixed up. <laughs> and accidentally take all the plaque off me nunny. <laughs> magazines there are only two options for hair down there for women the options are all off or most off give us a cheer if you think all off is the way to go <laughs> is that a filler in the middle of that thing <laughs> it's not technically aimed at you love i suppose it is good to know we've got a paedophile in um, <laughs> that's what it means that's what it means give us a cheer if you think most off is the way to go yeah. still quite a lot of you left isn't there <laughs> I can only assume that the rest of you are like me. I just try to keep it in me pants. <laughs> Even if sometimes that involves tucking it in. But surely the most ridiculous of all of the things we are supposed to do to ourselves is anal bleaching. Now, some of you might not know what that is. If you don't know what it is, it's exactly as it sounds. Some people, and I don't know why, I can't answer that question for you. Some people choose to have their arseholes bleached. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, regardless of your gender, regardless of your sexuality, if somebody is so close to your arsehole that they can see the colour of it, <laughs> they're not going to stop. <laughs> this, this is never going to happen. Ooh, 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 smack, <laughs> smack. <laughs> oh, sorry, love, I don't do that colour. Now, isn't it? <laughs> now, let me tell you a story now, um, if I may. Most comedians finish work at sort of 10, 30, 11, um, and invariably will drive home wherever possible. So getting in at maybe 12 or 1 or 2. Uh, me, personally, when I get home, uh, in order to get the adrenaline out of my system so I can sleep at all, I will do one of two things. I'm not a drinker, so I'll either have a bath or I'll watch a bit of telly. And normally one of those two things will work. Every now and again, though, they don't work and I can't sleep at all. It's rare. I'm lucky like that, but it does happen. The last time it happened to any degree was uh, February last year. I got in from work, I did the usual things, no success. I did the worst thing you can possibly do when you can't sleep, which is go on the internet. Because uh, it probably wakes you up, doesn't it? But I'd sort of abandoned the idea of sleep and I was happily clicking from website to website. Now, 2.30 is a normal time for me to go to bed. When it starts to get to 3, 3.30, I start to feel tired and I suppose just a bit, a bit lonely, I suppose. And a little bit like I'm the only person awake in the world. And I know that my tired brain does things that my rested brain would never allow. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the story, I mentioned that uh, I got divorced. I got married the first time at 22 and divorced at 29. I suppose getting married at 22 is quite young, but I was very much swept off my feet. I think the main reason I said yes to going out with him in the first place was the fact that he wrote me 
a poem. Nobody had written me a poem before. Nobody has written me a poem since. I don't really know much about poetry, but I know that this was just lovely. He'd handwritten it. He gave it to me on a sheet of paper, and I read it, and I just fell. I remember folding it really small, and I put it in my purse. And every time I had like a shitty day at work, I'd get on the bus to go home, and I'd get my poem out, and I'd read it to myself. And I'd think, somebody feels this way about me to have written this about me. I'm not having a shitty day anymore. Now, a little after five years, I lost it. To this day, I have no idea where it went, and I was distraught. It meant so much to me. But after a while, after I'd calmed down, I thought, I wonder if I've memorised it from all of those times of reading it to myself. So I got a sheet of paper and a pen, and sure enough, it all came out. And I folded it up small, and I put it back in my purse where it belonged. Now, if we scoot ahead to February last year, it's 3.30 a.m. I'm tired, and I'm on the internet. And I just thought... We've been divorced nine years. That was a lovely poem. I bet he's given it to somebody else. <laughs> I bet it's on a blog. I bet some skinny 22-year-old fucking bitch has got it as a Facebook status. <laughs> so I picked a line from it, and I googled it. And there were 305,000 examples of the poem. <laughs> wasn't my poem. It wasn't his poem. It was written by Samuel Coleridge. <laughs> I wonder it was fucking good. <laughs> but I felt sort of broken, like my heart had been broken all over again. I felt hurt and a little bit stupid. I didn't really know what to do with this new information. So I texted my fella on the off chance that he was still awake, and he was, thank God, and he rang, and he said, what's up? And I told him the whole thing. And my fella's a very sensible man. And he had a little think, and he said, just because that was a lie doesn't mean the rest was a lie. And I thought, that's pretty good. So I hung up from him, but I still wasn't happy. It was still whirling around in my head. What was starting to happen that I didn't like was it was starting to colour my idea of my ex-husband. It was starting to make me think of him as a bad person. And he wasn't a bad person. We split up relatively amicably. He just stopped loving me, which is very sad and hard for me to understand, given the fact that I'm awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. Um, <laughs> but he felt, it felt to me like he was a bowl of clear water with a drop of blue dye about to go in and colour the whole thing, and I didn't think that was fair on him. And I was thinking, I wonder if I can come up with another example of something similar. Somebody who is inherently good, but has done one bad thing, but you still think of them as a good person. And I racked my brains, and I could think of no one. I did, however, think of an example of the opposite. Somebody who was inherently bad, but had done one good thing, but I still thought of them as a bad person. And that person was Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> I understand the concept of not speaking ill of the dead, but I also understand that I told this story for the first time while she was still alive. And coming from a mining background, I will not allow her to ruin my show. the way she ruined the lives of my dad and his friends. Now, one thing you might not know about Margaret Thatcher is that she was partly responsible for the invention of Mr. Whitby ice cream. She studied science at university. She was one of a team of scientists who invented the machine that puts the air through the ice cream to create Mr. Whitby ice cream. So for all of the atrocities that I believe she committed, <laughs> Mr. Whitby ice cream's still pretty fucking nice, isn't it? <laughs> But it felt to me very much like she was still a bowl of blue dye with a drop of clear water hovering above the surface. And I went to bed and I slept like a baby. And I woke up the next morning and I still felt okay. And I thought, I'm going to ring my dad. Now, my dad is an exceptional listener. My dad is my second port of call, always after my fella, if I have anything troubling me. And I told him the whole thing and he listened very quietly. And I said, so do you see how I've worked it out that none of us are 100% good or bad? We're all a mixture of the two. He said, yes, I can see what you've done. I said, did you know about the ice cream thing? He said, no, I didn't. I said, so how does that make you feel now? And he went quiet. It couldn't have been for minutes. It must have only been for seconds, but it felt like a long time. And he went, do you really want to know how I feel? I said, I think it would help me, Dad. He went quiet again, and he went, you're not allowed, Mr. Whitby, anymore. <laughs> In 
the space of about six hours, I'd lost my poem and Mr. Whippy for life. <laughs> I didn't tell him that Osama bin Laden invented midget gems. <laughs> he didn't. There's people over there going, did he? He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> My parents were always very good to my sister and I when we were kids, very good at rewarding us when we did things right. And I don't mean with, when I say rewards, I don't mean like money or, or presents, I just mean with praise. So if we did something good, we got a well done. And while it's probably quite a good way of raising kids, it has turned me into a slightly needy adult. I went to the swimming baths with my fella. I did one length, one length, and I stopped at the end and tried to catch his eye. And he looked up as if to say, are you all right? And I went like this. <laughs> And he just mouthed, well done, thank you. <laughs> but my parents still reward my sister and I, even, even though we're 38 and 44, they still do it now. I had to drive in the snow the last time we had really bad snow. I don't like driving in the snow, it makes me nervous, but I had a show to get to, there was no alternative, so I got in the car and I drove. And I got there without any real mishap, but I thought I should text the people that knew I was worried about the journey, just let them know I'd arrived safely. So I texted my fella, my agent, and my dad. My fella replied, Great, I'll see you later. My agent replied, lovely, have a smashing show. And my dad replied, who's a clever girl? <laughs> and I just texted back, me, ha <laughs> ha <laughs> The fourth thing I decided to do, I decided to let the boy move in with me. Uh, my boy, sorry, I should clarify. Uh, not just any boy. I didn't just open the front door and go, you put your paper bag down, get in here. <laughs> My boy, we've been together for seven years. We've always lived apart. Latterly, we were 90 miles apart. Uh, but we both live on the road, so we still saw each other three, four, five times a week, and it was great. And then I bought a house, and he was considering where he was going to buy his house, and he said, I've been thinking about maybe Oxford. And I realised that was further away than you already was, and I think sometimes your heart just comes out of your mouth, because I said, every time you step over that front door, you're too far away. Aww. So we moved in, shut up. And... <laughs> totally live with the boy now. I can see a willy whenever I like. <laughs> but people still do that thing to us. You know when they do that, you never really know somebody till you've lived with them. I hate that. We've been together for seven years, shut your face. You never really know somebody till you've lived with them. I hate it because it's such utter fucking truth. <laughs> Some people are glass half empty and some people are glass half full. My fellow is glass too full, just fills them to the brim and walks really gingerly everywhere. <laughs> it's got a touch of OCD that I didn't know about. He checks all of the doors eight times before we go to bed, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. I just think it's a shame he hasn't got the OCD. That means he might use a fucking mop once in a while. <laughs> So he's a psychopath. It's very early stages, but it's definitely there. The way I know he's a psychopath is that he opens a milk when there's already a milk open. <laughs> Who the fuck does that? <laughs> Psychopaths, that's who. I said to him, did you not see that there was already a milk open? And he went, yeah. <laughs> I said, why didn't you just use that one then? He said, I didn't know if it was all right. <laughs> Just have a sniff of it. I said, why didn't you just have a sniff of it? He said, well, I do, but even then I can't always tell. I mean, don't get me wrong, the fact that he hasn't got a very good sense of smell can sometimes work for me. <laughs> but when we first started going out, uh, we weren't really even girlfriend and boyfriend. It was really early days in our relationship. We decided to go away on a dirty weekend. Give us a cheer if you've ever been on a dirty weekend. <laughs> a lot of you, but there will be more of you, but you will have just realised that it wasn't with the person you're sitting beside. <laughs> Woo oh, no! <laughs> I'd never been on a dirty weekend. I didn't know what sorts of things you're supposed to take. Let's get some suggestions from you guys. Let's start at the top, because that worked well last time. Anybody in the top level want to shout out what you think you take on a dirty... God, I haven't even finished the fucking sentence, love! <laughs> The lady said handcuffs. What kind of handcuffs? Furry. Furry, ah. Oh. It was last time I was, I was working in Newcastle, a lady was on this level and she shouted out, handcuffs, like that. And I said, oh, have you got the heavy duty ones or the fluffy ones? And she said, I'm not telling you that. I'm sitting beside me, ma'am. <laughs> you still shouted out fucking handcuffs. There was a fella the other day shouted out a bag of lube. And I was like, I'm pretty sure it comes in a tube. <laughs> I am a 
imagined it being like an Asda bag for life and he just dipped himself in every now and again. <laughs> Anybody else upstairs want to shout? A rabbit. A rabbit. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought for a minute I was like, no. <laughs> you mean, yeah, because I was in Cheltenham and three people shouted out rabbit one after the other and I thought, fucking hell, Chaz and Dave are in. <laughs> Level down, up a circle. Anybody got a suggestion what you take on a dirty weekend? Anal beads. Eight, where are you? Where's hello flower? Anal beads. <laughs> wow. Have you? Have you? Have you? I don't, why am I whispering? I'm in the microphone. <laughs> Nobody else is listening, flower. Have you got anal beads? I've got plenty of things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've got loads of things. I've got, you know, handbag and that. <laughs> Is that the most extreme thing you've got, love? No. no. <laughs> Didn't think it was. Now tell me about anal beads. Uh, they go up your arsehole. I figured that bit out myself. <laughs> Can you still wear them as jewellery after that, though? <laughs> yes. Just make sure you've always got brown earrings and then you're fine. <laughs> Anybody else in the top two sections? Oh Willy warmers. A willy warmer. <laughs> Why is it going to be so cold? <laughs> I feel sad for the willy, do you? <laughs> I mean, there is some way you could keep it warm, love. <laughs> That's not an offer. Fuck, that sounded like a date. <laughs> uh, why would you take a willy warmer, love? A man's always cold. Mine's always cold. <laughs> Have you tried just giving it a good roll? <laughs> Let's come down the, the uh, grand circle, anybody? A cucumber. A cucumber? <laughs> Fuck you, I'm not taking salad. section? Cake, where are you, love? <laughs> now you're fucking talking. <laughs> now, is the cake for eating or, like, for... I was going to... I don't know what that was. <laughs> I was going to say smearing, but that feels like a really bad word. Smearing. Is the cake for smearing or for eating, love? Everything. Or oh, a little bit of both. I like that. There was a lady the other day who said chocolate body paint, and I said, well, only if I can paint it on my palms and lick it off myself, because I'm not fucking sharing. <laughs> You stay where you are, love. Uh -huh. mm. Mm. No, no, it's definitely you making me do those noises. Oh, no. <laughs> there was another lady shouting, shout again, love. A Bread. A friend. <laughs> Bread. It was. A couple of weeks ago, somebody shouted out, creme fraiche, and I thought, ooh. And then when I got off stage, she sent me a message on Twitter saying, no, I said femme fresh." Oh. <laughs> uh, anybody else in that section? A ball gag. A ball gag? <laughs> That's something you haven't got, isn't it, love? <laughs> There was a lady, a lady said, bondage gear. And I said, do you tie your partner up or does your partner tie you up? And she said, I tie him up and then I fuck off. <laughs> now let's do the, the, the rest of the boxes. And anybody downstairs got a suggestion what you take on a dirty weekend? What was that? Blow hold on, hold on. A what? <laughs> a blow, did you really say a blow torch? <laughs> In case you fancied a creme brulee. <laughs> and was there another one over here? Via, where's the Viagra? Where did you, that you there? Oh, how you doing? You all right, love? <laughs> Is that, does that work for you? That's how she was made. <laughs> Has she just found out as well, or? Oh, look at her, she's mortified. <laughs> so is it, lovely girl, hello, is it good to know that your dad had a proper all weekend? 
Two nights in a row. <laughs> what about the bit, like the daytime? Is it like that through the day as well? Or, you know, how do you get your clothes on? <laughs> you just push it down and then does it like, boy, oi, oi, oi. I'm always disappointed they don't do that noise. Boy, oi, 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 oi. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. <laughs> It was Butlins. <laughs> Viagra at Butlins. <laughs> Sounds like a Mills and Boone, doesn't it? <laughs> it was the lady said, uh, crotchless pants. And I thought, well, I've often got a hole in, but it's never in the right place. <laughs> but it, one thing you've forgotten as well is you, if you're going to take your rabbit, if you, you're going to take your, <laughs> you're going to take batteries. You've got to take spare batteries because you don't want <laughs> to turn into a wall wall. <laughs> All I'm doing now is stirring it. <laughs> I rang my fella uh, before we went away and I said to him, I've been to family planning. And he must have thought, this isn't going to be sexy at all. I said, I've got some condoms, because I'd heard they were free there, and I love a bargain. <laughs> and he said, well, that's good, that's good. I said, I've got 36, do you think that'll be enough? <laughs> and quick as a flash, he just went, well, you can leave 32 of them at home. <laughs> and I thought, that's still four, though, isn't it? And he went, we'll use two of those for water balloons. <laughs> it's good to know that he had activities planned. <laughs> But we've settled into quite a nice place. I think we're very comfortable with each other in a really nice way. Uh, he walked in the bathroom recently to brush his teeth while I was in the bath, and that's fine. We don't go to the toilet in front of each other, but it's fine if he wants to brush his teeth while I'm in the bath. And the main reason it's fine is because I'm happy with my figure. He's seen all of it, and he likes what he sees. There's nothing to worry about. But he did check me out when he came, and he probably looked me up and down, which came as a bit of a surprise. And then he opened his mouth, and I thought, I wasn't expecting a fucking review. <laughs> And he said only two words. He leaned over me in the bath and he went, Nice torso. Who uses the word torso? <laughs> Psychopath told you. <laughs> but there was one time we were both going out to work at the same time, both fully dressed, uh, just getting sort of bags and coats and things together. And he was sitting at the kitchen table putting his shoes on. And I don't know why, but as I walked past him, I did a boob jiggle in his face, just one of those right in his face. I don't know why, it felt like a waste opportunity because he was at a good height. If I didn't do it, when am I going to get the chance again? So I did a boob jiggle in his face. And I thought he'd do that thing, you know, where, where people, they put their head right between and do the noise, you know, the <laughs> like that. It's got a special name. Does anybody know the name? Motorboat. Motorboat. And thank you, because I always accidentally call it waterboarding. <laughs> Only waterboard if they're really sweaty. <laughs> That's what I thought he'd do. I thought he'd do that like that. He didn't, you know what he did? He just stood up and did a boob jiggle back. <laughs> now it's a thing that we do and I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> but you know when you first get together, especially if you have an inkling, it might be a long-term thing, and those first six months together are just glorious, aren't they? And, and you just think each other are perfect, and after six months you think, well, perfect's pushing it a bit. <laughs> There's a couple of things I could do with changing. <laughs> then you've got a project. Isn't it lovely having a project? I love a project. There's only one thing I'd like to change about my fella. I need to tell you this first. I love waving. I don't know why. I've always loved waving. I love waving. I love it when people wave back to me. I'm going to wave to you now and see how many people wave back. Quite a few of you are upstairs as well. Thank you very much. It makes me really happy, and it's one of the main reasons I learned to drive. <laughs> My fella doesn't wave. doesn't occur to him in the slightest. When we first got together, one of the times he dropped me off at the train station, I got out of the car... And I said, I'll see you on Tuesday. He said, yeah, yeah, but I'll give you a ring when I get in tonight. I said, smashing. And then I checked just to make sure I was at the right door for my particular platform at this train station. And I turned to give him a little wave goodbye, and the car was already in the distance. <laughs> a few years later, I was going to Australia for the first time. I was travelling alone. I was going to be away for six weeks. I was very nervous. He dropped me off at the airport. He helped me out of the boot. Uh, with my case, no, sorry, with my case, no. <laughs> it's not that much of a psychopath. <laughs> I'm allowed to sit in the car <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> but I had this huge case, so he helped me get the case out, and I said, oh, God, I'm going to miss you. And he said, I'm going to miss you too, but he said, you know what, we can Skype whenever you like. He said, you know, you're going to have an amazing time, and I'll come and get you in six weeks' time. Bless. And then 
I did that thing, you know, you have to check you've got your passport and your ticket and your keys and your wallet. I checked all the things I needed in my bag. And then I checked I was at the right terminal and I turned to give him a little wave goodbye. Six weeks we were going to be apart. We'd never been apart that length of time before. I turned to give him a little wave goodbye and I could not see the car. <laughs> he was already on the fucking motorway. <laughs> So I said to him recently, I said, you know, the waving thing. He said, did I forget to do it again? I said, no, it's fine. Don't worry. I said, I know you don't do. But I said, you know how much I love it? He said, yes, I know how much you love to wave. I said, I was just wondering if there was a bargaining thing we could do. He said, I don't know what you mean. I said, well, for example, is there anything I don't do that you'd like me to start doing? <laughs> Turns out I'm not as bothered about waving as I thought. No compromise. But when I lived alone, I really liked it. I really liked living alone. But one of the things I love about living with somebody else again is I like the unpredictability of it. I like that every now and again a sentence will come out that I would never have said. The most recent one, out of nowhere, he just went. Your shed's no good to have a wank in. <laughs> and I said, that's because it's a greenhouse, love. <laughs> but you know, we're all getting older. I turn 39 this year. I'm not worried about turning 40 next year. I'm not worried about getting older at all. And I think that's because I have good friends in their 40s, 50s, 60s. My parents are sort of late 60s, early 70s. And they all seem to be having quite a nice time. What I see is my future is not a scary one. My parents have this thing that I think happens to a lot of people when they retire. It's all of a sudden they can see their friends a lot more often. They can do hobbies they've never had time for. And they're so busy, they think to themselves, how on earth did we fit work in? Which must be a lovely state of affairs, must not it? My mum was shown as a diary because she said it was chock a block she said look at this she said we were going to go and see Oliver the musical that day but we can't because we forgot we had Swan Lake booked in at the Empire she's only this tall she looked up at me with this face that I adore and she went <laughs> I haven't got time to die <laughs> I said I don't think that's how it works mum just the grim reaper standing behind and she's going I can't do October I can't do November Want to see Tony Bennett in November? And the Grim Reaper's like, Tony Bennett, I've been after him for years. <laughs> but for the last 16 or maybe even 17 years, my mum and dad's uh, annual holiday has been one week in Edinburgh. They love the city, they have friends there, they go, they have a smash and tie and they come home, all good. But for some unknown reason, two years ago, they decided to book a cruise. And I said to me, mum, that's very adventurous, what made you book a cruise? And she said, we just saw them loads at the telly. And I said... Yeah, Mum, I'm pretty sure that was the news. <laughs> they were running aground and people were dying. And my mum and dad are like, that looks lovely, she would do that. <laughs> my parents and all have a similar joy for life. They have a real knack for being able to turn a bad situation into a good one. I think it's something we could really learn from, all of us, I think. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of this. They're both semi-retired, and my father-in-law was caught speeding. Now, I don't know if you know this, I didn't know this, that if you're caught speeding and you choose to do the speed awareness course, that you have to do it in the town where you were caught as opposed to where you live if it's different. They're based in the Midlands. He was caught speeding in Bournemouth. <laughs> and my mother-in-law said to me, we've decided to make a weekend of it. <laughs> Adorable. <laughs> but I know getting older is no plain sailing. I, I know that there are problems along the way. One of my friends is uh, in her 60s. Have we got any women who are 60 or above? Give us a cheer. <laughs> a few of you. So maybe you can vouch if this is true or not. Uh, one of my friends, she's 62, and she said, there's something I need to tell you. I said, that sounds really serious. Is it serious? She said, well, I just don't want it to come as much of a surprise to you as it did to me. I said, okay, well, you better tell us what it is then. She said, when you get to my age... Down there, instead of it being a lovely, healthy pink colour, I could have walked away right then and there. <laughs> Whatever you've got, I don't want to know. <laughs> instead of it being a lovely, healthy pink colour, it's more of a... It's more of a slate grey. <laughs> it's the detail that I love. She didn't say grey, she said slate grey. <laughs> like she'd have the Dulux colour chart out. <laughs> Yeah, Terry, look at that. Do you think that's thunder or slate? <laughs> I was so horrified.
horrified by what I just learned that I blurted out, you mean like when meat's on the turn? <laughs> Does that smell all right to you? <laughs> Be a few handbag mirrors coming out when they get in tonight, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> but my mum is... My mum is nearly 70 and she's in a wheelchair and sometimes people are mean to her because she's in a wheelchair, which is horrible and hurts all of us, but her especially. And uh, I was trying to think of just some... Just some small way that she could retaliate when that happens to make her feel a little bit better, you know? And I was trying to teach her the cough swear thing. You know the cough swear thing? Oh, so. <laughs> I was trying to teach her that. Because she's always so immaculately dressed and her nails are always perfect. And I thought nobody for a second would suspect. They'd be like, did that lady just? <laughs> did she just? Oh, so. Did she just? <laughs> now look at her nails. Get her a lozenge. So we talked about it, we laughed about it, we moved on in conversation. About ten minutes later, I talked about something entirely different. And my mum said, uh, I had to go to the doctor's this week. I said, was everything all right? She said, yeah, but I had to see the nurse. I said, oh, is that not good? She said, oh, it's the one I don't really like. I said, oh, never mind. She said, yeah, you know the one I think's a bit of a cunt? <laughs> <laughs> My family are hilarious. It's very good. We all know that it's good to laugh. It is good to laugh when you're with your friends or your family. We all know uh, laughing does you good because it's medically proven to do you good, isn't yeah. it? It's medically well, we proven do. to do you good because it gets all of your dolphins out. <laughs> and you don't want them cooped up, do you? No. It's just cruel. But I'm lucky that I have very funny friends and family. And, and when I'm with my friends, it's amazing. So one of them will say something funny. Somebody tops and I top and it goes up and up and up and up. Yeah. And it's great. But I've noticed recently, one of my friends isn't really playing the game, and every time he says something, the whole lot comes crashing down and turns to shit. <laughs> so what I do now, just before he says anything at all, I just go, bank. <laughs> You've been lovely. Let me leave you with this. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to say in my show is that I'd like my life to slow down a bit. It's been very fast for the last five or six years, and it's been amazing, but I'd really like it to slow down a bit. I was very slow as a child. Uh, not like that. <laughs> I was just a dawdler. I used to take ages to do everything. I'd take ages to eat my breakfast. <clears throat> take ages to put my clothes on. <laughs> take ages to walk to school. was a busy mum. She had stuff to do, but she never said, come on, chop, chop, hurry up, we're going to be late. She didn't say any of those things. Instead of saying those things, she used to do the music from silent films. <laughs> so I'd beat my breakfast really slowly and she'd lean right into my ear and go, diddly dee, diddly dee, diddly dee, diddly dee, diddly dee. <laughs> Just makes you naturally quick and I don't know why. <laughs> I've only once used it as an adult. very smart crowd <laughs> and just so you know totally works <laughs> you've been lovely thanks very much for coming safe journey home everybody good night My cheeks hurt too. My hello cheeks. yeah i don't know if it's perma green or what it is yeah oh, mine yes. too oh yeah Oh my awesome. god, she's so funny. She is fucking yeah. brilliant. Oh my god, that's funny. Oh my god. Alright, so we got the whole show done. Yes. You might notice that we changed our shirts a couple times because we did this show over a couple days, so. Yeah, we had to. Yeah. yeah we had a lot of things to do. It's hard sometimes when you're doing a whole show, sometimes you just get interrupted or you gotta do something or whatever. So. Gotta feed the beast. <laughs> smash it all together and you guys can enjoy the whole thing, I hope. Yes. Oh my god, that was funny. So Sarah Milliken, that's great stuff. I don't stuff. even know what to say. It's just, it's just funny. That was awesome. Yeah. I did see that one little bit. We did that one clip. Yeah, we've done yeah, some clips of her, and I think one of them was in there. But yeah. 
Um, but it, it was just as funny now as yeah. it was then. But this is one of those shows that can do that copyright seems to be okay with. So. Right. It's hard to do full shows and clips sometimes because of copyright. But for some reason, she lets this one be seen, so. Which is great. Thankfully. And a few others, too. Thank so. you, Sarah. Hope you enjoyed that. That was hilarious. And we'll see you next time on the Brad and Lucy Show. Bye. <laughs>